Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. Greg was just remarking that he cannot believe that the draft is just about two weeks away. And certainly I know you, Greg, uh, every fan of football listening to this and the organizations who are getting ready to fill out their rosters definitely can believe it's two weeks away because they've been waiting quite some time to get to this point, as we all have. And I know that you're probably exhausted, but just as excited to get this underway too. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I put in so much time watching players on tape and I watch them in, in great detail. So, you know, I, as I mentioned to you before we started, I think I've probably seen about 110 guys in the detail with which I want to see them and probably 30 or 40 others somewhat, which I'd like to see more of. And maybe I will. There's still two weeks, but there's also other guys I would really like to get to. Um, but, you know, I just really enjoy the process. And you know, it's two weeks away. And I guess for many, it's like, oh, I can't wait till it gets here. For me, it's like, oh, I wish I had another week because there's more guys I want to watch, you know, <laughs> but hey, that's it. That's when it is on the calendar. That's the schedule. Absolutely. Yeah. The NFL continues to keep itself top of mind with the way that they've uh, structured their off season and the draft is one of the biggest events for uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, before we get into cornerbacks today, Greg, and there's some really interesting guys at the cornerback position in this draft class, uh, Josh Allen did agree to a new deal. Not that Josh Allen, but the Jacksonville Jaguars Josh Allen did agree to a new deal today. The money uh, isn't important around here, but just for reference, it's yeah, a five-year, $150 million yeah, deal. Yeah. But the impact, they, as you said before we started the podcast, it's not like they were going to let him walk. No, and, and the, you know, with the, with the salary cap going up every year, the money's the money. And I know fans react to it, whether, oh, they paid him too much or this guy's not worth it. That becomes irrelevant. The money keeps going up because the salary cap goes up. So whenever a really good player, and obviously he's coming off a terrific season, his best season in the league, um, and he's a really important player to their defense. And I know they have a brand new defensive coordinator. They have Ryan Nielsen now who came from Atlanta, who did an amazing job, by the way, in Atlanta. That was one of the most fun defenses to watch, believe, believe it or not. Obviously, people are not necessarily focused on the Falcons, but that was a really fun defense to watch from a tactical and schematic perspective. Um, he's now down with Jacksonville. Um, as you said, they were not going to let him walk. He's a really good player. And the money is is what it is. That's just the way sports are now. You, we know how that works. Anytime a really good or great player comes up, he's likely to break the bank at that given position. Yeah, that's typically the way that goes, whether it's quarterback, edge rusher. We saw it happen with uh, Chris Jones, the defensive tackle this year. He did set a franchise single season record for sacks, 17 and a half yeah. uh, last year. And and you mentioned uh, Nielsen coming over from Atlanta. The, People, as you said, Greg, people probably weren't, unless you're a Falcons fan, you're probably not locked in on Falcons football no. uh, throughout the course of the, the year. And it was certainly a struggle for them um, in a, a division that was there to be had. And the Bucks went out there and took it. The Grady Jarrett got hurt very early in the year. In fact, I think he got hurt in the Titans game, if memory serves. And they did add some safeties last year in Atlanta that that helped them um, with their coverage unit, they have uh, they have a, a lot of interesting pieces there. But what Nielsen was able to do creatively without any kind of top flight uh, pressure, uh, no. any, any, anybody who's I mean, who, who the, the the average NFL fan would really recognize beyond Grady Jarrett is one. Well, of the they, they did have one player who they'd recognize and he had to use him as an edge pass rusher for a good part of the season. And he's not an edge pass rusher, even though you could argue he's maybe a hall of fame player is Calais Campbell. Yeah. Uh, and, and Calais Campbell, I, have you ever seen him in person, by the way? I have. He was with the yeah. Jags for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. I, I met him at, uh, at a Super Bowl event a number of years ago. Um, he was actually there with his sister and, um, I, I'm a pretty, as you know, we know each other, you know, I'm reasonably tall, you know, you're not short either. He's a big man. <laughs> there's there's a difference between me at six two, Greg, you at six four, and Calais Campbell at six eight. Yeah, and 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 he just had that look of a really really big man. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, his sister was like six feet six one, and uh, yeah, and she was you know one of those just stunning looking women. But um, anyway, they had to use him last year at, at as an edge rusher. So just to show you how how Nielsen had to cobble it together with players who really weren't meant to play those positions. 
but he did a great job. They had Jesse Bates, who's a really right. smart back end safety um, and sees things really well. And in fact, made a number of plays last year where I know for a fact that he just kind of freelanced because of the way he saw it and read it. And, you know, when you have players who can do that and they're right, that really is helpful. Um, but they were fun to watch because they were schematically fun. He did a lot of things, a lot of late coverage rotation. They played a good amount of man. Um, he, he was just a it was a fun defense to watch. And and as you said, they were in it till the very end. And and injured, not to spend too much time on the Jags here to, to start the podcast, but just with with that particular defense, Greg, and, and you know, the the investment that they made in Trayvon Walker. We'll yep. see what happens. He's he's still a very young player, though. Um, you know, not uh, anybody can back or armchair GM Aiden Hutchinson over Trayvon Walker after the results were had. But they felt confident in the player with within the the scope of the talent that they had, and they've been picking at the top of the draft for a couple of years now with Trevor Lawrence and Josh Allen, Trayvon Walker, and things like that. I'm just curious to see how this experiment in Jacksonville is going to go because they're they're at a pretty uh, big uh, crunch time moment with them for where the Texans are uh, and where the Titans and Colts might be trending if Anthony Richardson and Will Levis can figure it out. Yeah, and obviously they weren't happy with their defense a year ago, so they made wholesale changes. As we mentioned, they brought in Ryan Nielsen. Um, But then they have the whole offensive situation as well because – Uh, Certainly Trevor Lawrence, after his first year with Doug Peterson, where they made the playoffs and won the playoff game with a big comeback, it did not quite happen the way I'm sure they anticipated a year ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Trevor Lawrence, uh, you know, I still think he's a good player, but, you know, he didn't take that step that everybody assumed he would take to become maybe a top five or six quarterback in the league. But he certainly has enough talent to do that. So um, in some ways, both sides of the ball, I don't want to say they're questions. That would be too strong. I think, Buck, but I think that at this point, we're kind of all waiting to see where they are, Um, you know, because they still have some talented players. They uh, they signed Gabe Davis, I believe, from Mm -hmm. Buffalo, who to me is a number two or a number three, probably a number three. But um, they get Christian Kirk back, who was injured quite a bit a year ago. Um, They still have some explosive weapons overall on offense. They have ATN. Um, So it really comes down to what Doug Peterson and staff can continue to get out of Trevor Lawrence. Can he reach that level where you feel every single week that he's going to be the guy that can give you a great opportunity to win? Because that wasn't necessarily the case a year ago. No. And as we talked about it, and I believe you, you said it best, it just felt like a bit of a lost season for Lawrence. Um, working working his way through a variety of different things including yeah, injury. injuries yeah uh, you know but uh, you know the injury thing a lot of guys get injured I, again you know I'm, I'm not an NFL quarterback I don't want to sit here and say that it's easy but I think if you spoke to any player and I've had this you know I've been grateful to be able to do that through the years with players former players I've worked with you know players I know that you know they'll tell you that if they're out there playing it doesn't matter you got to perform that's the nature of the business. And I think they all know what they sign up for. If you're out there playing, you got to perform. No one after a game says a player that is, well, I would have played better, but, you know, my my right ankle was hurting. You know, you're never going to hear that. Uh, no, nobody cares. Work harder. It's uh, it's exactly. just the, just exactly. the way that the, the world works, not well, just football. But football or in the old days, good. you know, just rub some dirt on it. We're good to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when concussions were still getting your bell rung, that's that's the right, rub your right, dirt right. on it. Yeah, well, we don't yeah. want to go. There. That's 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 a little more serious. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we'll talk about some corners in this upcoming draft. And it is a talented cornerback class in particular. Um, um, it's, I, a de- it's a deep one. I don't know if there's. They'll be drafted high because it's a premium position. I'm mm-hmm. sorry to interrupt, but I don't know if there's the special guy. Like, there's no Patrick Sertan in this draft. Uh, important clarification because uh, people, you know, I, I don't – people who don't scout these guys as thoroughly as as you or some of the other NFL draft analysts might may not distinguish that, but it's important to – to uh, qualify this conversation with that, I do want to start with uh, with an uh, an interesting player, Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Everybody knows how good the Iowa defense is. Um, his pro day was spectacular. He's a very athletic player. He's not, uh, as you said, a he's not certainly not a Patrick Sertan type um, no. when you look at him, but he's got the starting experience. Uh, at both at strong safety and at corner in the Iowa defense. And I got the opportunity, Greg, to see him win the Music City Bowl MVP a couple of years ago against Kentucky. Just a really, really fun, high-effort player who uh, certainly fit well within that scheme. What do you see when you watch him? Yeah, he's going to be an interesting guy, Buck, in, in the way he's seen by different coaches and different teams. 
There'll be a number of teams, I guarantee you, that see him as a safety or a star, meaning a, a slot, you know, much like the way Jalen Ramsey was used with the Rams. And I'm not making a direct comparison of players. I'm talking about how they'd be deployed in the context of a defense. Mm -hmm. um, he may not have all the requisite traits for the corner position at the next level that you really want. I mean, he has outstanding size. He's got length. He's he's straight line linear and he's fast. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that when you watch his tape, you see that there are times when th he has to uh, change direction. You know, we talk about direction change. We talk about transition. We talk about those kinds of things with corners. He may not have exactly that with, with what you want. Um, so I'm going to be really curious to see where he's drafted and how teams see him. Um, so, uh, you know, he's just a little stiff. Um, even though that he's really fast, um, sometimes he looks twitchy just because of the way, you know, he's a big guy who moves well because he's got really good size. Um, I think he's better playing off coverage with, with, with vision, reading through the receiver to the quarterback uh, than he is playing press because when he had to turn and run, a little stiff, and he didn't really locate the ball really well when he was in press man and, and uh, playing vertical routes. Uh, somebody who does not seem to have an issue with physicality is Quinion Mitchell. Uh, oh. He's very well built, um, had uh, one of the best showings of any player at any position at the Combine uh, last month, or I guess two months ago in February when we were all up in Indianapolis. Uh, coming out of Toledo, you know, there's always, uh, anytime you go through the draft process yeah. with not a group of five uh, teams or, or programs, you get the question about, well, are they playing up to the level of competition right. that they'll see in the NFL? This is a player, Greg, who seems like he's going to make it uh, just fine at the next level, again, depending on where he lands. Fascinating guy. I mean, really good size, ran an incredible 40 time. Um, predominantly in Toledo's defense, he played off coverage. Okay. He was not a press corner. Now he has the, the physical traits to do so, but you've got to teach him how to play press. So that's something to keep in mind as he makes the transition to the NFL, that he has very few snaps at playing press, uh, but he's got size, he's got speed, he's got physicality, he's competitive, um, He's got a really well-built frame. He almost looks more like a big running back than a corner. Um, he's got light feet. Now, he was really, really good because he played so much off coverage. He was explosive with downhill plant and drive from off coverage or click and close, another term people like to use. But playing off, you obviously have to react to the receiver and throws in front of you. And he was explosive doing that. And he was really, really good at the catch point. Not necessarily, not with interceptions. He didn't make many his career, but great physicality at the catch point with unbelievable timing to get his hands or his hands on the ball and knock it out of the receiver's hands. He did that a lot because he has the speed to be able to run with receivers. So he would stay right with them and basically be on their in their hip pocket, even though he did not make any interceptions. Basically, I think he had five in his career yeah. and four team in one game two years ago. So, um, you know, I think he has all the needed traits, Buck, to develop into a high level outside corner. My guess is he'll come off the board in the first round just because the size and the traits and the speed. Yeah, and as you said, corner a premium position, especially oh, yeah. where the receivers are making thirty mil a year nowadays. You got to find corners who can get out there and stop them. Um, Alabama always capable of producing uh, high level defensive backs this year. No different. Kool Aid McKinstry is a three year starter coming out of the Crimson Tides program. I really like his game, Greg. He just displays a level of patience uh, that yeah. I enjoy watching. Not not overly fast, but he does seem to have that burst when it matters to be able to close out on plays. Yeah, you, you hit it right on the head, Buck. I mean, he he to me is a press man corner. Um, that so if you feature man coverage, you know, and as your foundation with press a significant part of your approach, this guy f would fit for you. He's very patient. He's very comfortable. Um, he he has no problem matching up on the outside. He see to use the, the term we like to use. He stays in phase. He stays attached to the receiver through intermediate and vertical routes. Um, he's very poised and comfortable and relaxed playing press man. Um, he may not have great vertical speed, uh, you know, top end speed as as people like to say, 
but he's certainly not slow. Um, so I think ultimately that's who he is. Um, that's the strength of his game. He's, uh, I think he's a little bit better in press man than his teammate, Terry and Arnold, who might be better overall, but I think McKinstry as a press man corner might have the edge based on tape. Well, and certainly when you talk about Terry and Arnold, I mean, that that is a, a different kind of player with that athletic ability, with that fast, uh, that with with that speed, the agility, very twitchy, I think is a word that you hear a lot with corners. And he definitely displays that. What what did I mean? The Alabama defense always has these high level defensive backs and, and Saban oh, yeah. has done well over the course of the year. And obviously this is a position that he knows as well as any position in the sport, having coached it for as long as he did. But what do you see with the way that they used both of these guys together and how much it allowed Arnold to be able to play that, the, play that specific style? Well, you might see throughout the SEC, which I think most people recognize is the best football conference in the country, you probably see more press man coverage in the SEC than in any conference in the country. And Arnold was a mirror match master. And by mirror match, I mean, he didn't necessarily jam you, you know, stab you when you came off the ball, but he just attached himself to you. He's got really light, deceptively sudden feet and movement. He's very smooth. He's very fluid. He's got easy transition and change of direction. Um, he, he didn't, you know, the one thing that you just have to be aware of with him, and, and I'm, I'm curious to know if this can be worked on, there were times where he would lose contact with the receiver at the top mm. of the route stem. Um, and again, it wasn't one of those issues where he went, oh man, he can't play. But I just think that that's something that he needs to work on um, because he would play it really, really well. And then at the top of the route stem, sometimes he would just lose contact when the receiver broke one way or the other. And the receiver was essentially open for a brief moment of time. And you know, in the NFL, that brief moment of time sometimes is all you need. Yeah, absolutely. It's it was a fun pair to watch all year long, and you know, talking talking to a, a number of people in the pre draft process, it just seems uh, that the not maybe not quite consensus that you get, but that Kool Aid is probably the more reliable and consistent player, while while Arnold probably has the 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 higher top end ceiling uh, of the two players. Between and Arnold, them. the one thing about Arnold, which is worth mentioning, because there are some coaches that really focus on this. He's far and away the more physically competitive corner than McKinstry when it comes to playing the run. He is willing to really stick his nose in. He was physical. He was aggressive. That really stood out on tape with Arnold. Uh, Greg, we always wrap up these podcasts with one prospect that you might want to get into. Maybe you haven't talked about him enough in your various visits. Is there a particular corner that jumps to mind or that somebody that you've been watching or somebody who made you put on a couple of extra games uh, so far in your <laughs> scouting process? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of guys, but I'll tell you one guy that kind of fascinates me and he's relatively local to me is Max Melton from Rutgers. Um, I'm sure you've seen the name. Have. Uh, he's another guy that is, is, you know, he played a lot of press. He's, he can match up basically to anybody with his athletic traits. I mean, you're dealing with a guy that ran a 4-3-9. His, his broad jump was phenomenal. His vertical jump was phenomenal. I mean, this guy is an athlete. Um, and he looks quick. He looks sudden. He's got some concerns in press where he got – he was getting beat off the snap. I think they're technique issues more than anything else, because he certainly can do it uh, from the perspective of being a, a physically gifted athlete. He's got long arms for his size at 5'11". Um, he was another guy that at times lost contact with the receiver at the top of the route. Um, and the other issue for him was sometimes he had an inability to stop when matching vertical releases, and that would result in him overrunning break points at times. But but he was really feisty. He was really competitive. You love the way he played. Um, my guess is, and I, you know, again, I'm not good at deciding where guys go, but I think he'll be a day two pick because he's got physical, athletic suddenness to him that you look for at the outside corner position. And he certainly could probably come inside and play in the slot. Yeah. I mean, forcing fumbles last year, he had a handful of tackles for loss. He even yeah. has a sack. Uh, in 2023 to go along with six pass breakups and three interceptions. So Fun guy. Fun guy to watch, even though there were some issues to clean up, which, you know, as you know, Buck, 99.9% .9 of the guys that come in the NFL, if not 100%, have some issues to clean up. Uh, so, you know, it's just like we know that not all 32 players chosen in the first round in, in two weeks are going to all be stars. We know that.
Uh, but at least one of them has to be, you know, the dreaded well, G word, Greg, generational. We haven't even talked about anybody generational this cycle. The seventh pick in the draft better be a star, though, this year. Oh, for God's sake. I don't care what he is as long as he's an offensive lineman that can keep that quarterback up off his back. But Well, you know, you know it's going to be interesting. I think we talked about this. I'm very curious to see, you know, depending on who's there at seven, what they do. I, I, I mean, I think I think the Titans, especially if, if you – if four quarterbacks go in the top five or six, you know, I'll be fascinated to see because that means one of those receivers is going to be there at seven. No, I th- I think I think from and to me to me I'm just I'm sorry to interrupt to me no please to me you c- I could make the argument okay and some could disagree but I could make the and and I'm making the argument based purely on tape you know that's all I'm doing I'm not making it any other way that any one of those three receivers should be higher on a draft board than any than any offensive lineman. Yes, absolutely. And so, I, again, I'm not saying that every team agrees with that. I'm saying based on tape study, I would say that. I would say that Harrison Neighbors and Adunze would be higher if I if I made a draft board, which I do not, but if I did, they'd all be higher than any of the of the uh, offensive tackles. Well, you talk to far more people than I do, Greg, but just based on my conversations, I would say that the league very much agrees with that assessment. Um, yeah. that, it, that's that's 6 to 11, really, uh, from the Chargers at 5 through uh, 11 right now, which is currently Minnesota. That has the potential to get kind of spicy. I, I'm it not does. sure what's going to happen. That, that, that could be really spicy. Absolutely. And the Titans sitting there at seven and we'll have a lot to talk about when we get together on May the 3rd, Friday, May the 3rd, to be specific at the live show where we, where we will be breaking down the entirety of the Titans draft class a mere six days after the draft goes down and the free agency acquisitions that they've been making. Greg has uh, is looking forward to coming down here, I know, and we can't wait to have you guys in the house. I'm looking forward to it, Buck. I'm really excited about that. I just remember how much fun last year was, and sounds like we'll have more people this year. I'm really looking forward to it. We are. We are definitely. We are definitely about. We, in fact, the, when I got my email uh, this morning, we had eclipsed the number of people that we had attend last year. We still have a handful of tickets left, though. But again, they're only twenty five bucks, so you want to get them fast because we're running out of time. If the draft is two weeks away, then the show is only three weeks away. And that is a fun deal that you're going to want to be a part of. So always appreciate Greg's time. We'll be to the draft soon enough. We've got, what, one more podcast to do before the draft is officially on our doorstep. And uh, I look forward to doing it again with you next week, buddy, when we'll be talking about some safeties and inside linebackers. All right. Sounds good, Buck.